Welcome to Speak of the Devils, the premier podcast for Sun Devil Athletics. I'm Brad Denny with 3TV. I'm Joe Healy with DevilsDigest.com. All right, Joe, we're probably past the coldest point of the year. Uh, we got the nice sunny 70 type uh, degree days in the forecast. And best of all, Sun Devil Baseball is just around the corner. Yep, things get started this weekend. Year three under Willie Bloomquist for ASU. A uh, lot, of, lot of questions, a lot of answers that uh, people will be looking for. Uh, we'll see how things pan out in the final year of the Pac-12. It's going to be an interesting year, and uh, right in this episode, we are going to dive very deep into Sun Devil Baseball, get a preview of this 2024 season. And, you know, Joe and I will give our thoughts here in a moment, but we really kind of defer this episode to the experts, including Scott Standuli of DevilsDigest.com, making his Speak of the Devils debut. And, of course, we've got to welcome back the skipper, Willie Bloomquist, the head coach of Sun Devil Baseball. He'll be joining us here in just a moment to go really in-depth into this program that – Joe, is really kind of another year, another big roster overhaul, a lot of new faces. Now, this is not just unique, of course, to baseball, of course, of college athletics altogether, but just another uh, year of so many new faces as this program under Willie Bloomquist is just trying to find the right, uh, right chemistry, the right makeup to get back to the postseason. Yeah, um, the last couple of years have really shown how the transfer portal can affect you in baseball. Uh, Obviously, ASU got quite a bit of talent last year, but they were one-and-done guys, guys that went to the draft. Uh, if my calculations are right. There are only three players on this roster that were on the team in 2022 in Willie Bloomquist's first year. Brian Campos, Jacob Tobias, Tyler Meyer, which is a pretty significant roster overhaul, not just year over year, but you know, two years running. Um, and that's kind of the nature of the beast. It's not said to, obviously – you know, slide anyone or anything like that. Uh, it's got to be a very difficult thing to try to stockpile talent, to try to recruit, to try to build a program. And, you know, just like it is with every many other sports where you don't want to just get mercenaries that are going to be there for just a year. You want to go after top talent, but it's, you can only imagine how challenging it is to build the roster. Yeah, it's obviously a, a challenge, an obstacle of cross call college sports. And then when you deal in the kind of the uh, situation with baseball and of course in this nil new world and we'll talk to willie about that exact point a little bit later on all kinds of challenges but as you as we talked about uh, in recent episodes there is some real returning talent here a good core of a son of a lineup at least <laughs> we'll talk about the pitching issues in a moment but you know joe let's start off with ryan campos uh, the veteran catcher freshman all-american that came back last year battled some injuries but still you know a guy who hits near 400 uh, and also a guy who, with all the young and new pitchers on this roster, having that veteran presence behind the plate is going to be huge. Yeah, he's the heart and soul of this team entering year three. You know, you'd imagine it's his final year at ASU. Uh, just an, an all-timer, great dude, great guy that loves his program, loves this area. Uh, as you mentioned, he's a little banged up at, at times last year, but when he's on, he's as good as there is in this conference uh, at any position. Uh, brings a lot of leadership, just everything that you want out of a player. So he, his, his role is going to be in a role in a number of different ways. And another third-year guy that I know you're pretty high on is uh, Jacob Tobias, a guy who just kind of goes about and gets the job done, You know, playing that first base position for the Devils last year, adding some nice pop, and just one of those guys that just, you know, this is a, a, a team that's going to probably rely early on on the offense as the pitching staff tries to find its legs. But a guy like Tobias, just a reliable presence that can drive in runs, is going to be huge. Yeah, he's someone that – doesn't get a ton of fanfare, but he steadily improved. Uh, I know from his freshman year to his sophomore year, he made, he made some significant physical changes that that helped him out. But uh, he's just a work, workhorse that goes out there and gets it done. And again, he's another guy in year three that is probably looking toward a MLB future after this season. So you know, it's a it's a big big year for him. And then a couple of other guys that are worth mentioning in terms of guys that are coming in into their sophomore year after getting significant playing time as true freshmen. Uh, one guy, Isaiah Jackson, a local guy, an Arizona product, who really flashed some amazing play uh, with the glove and defense. Had some struggles at the plate, but uh, new Contra uh, Contratus at the hot corner at third base. Really, because I think it was a nice surprise. It had some good pop. At, it seemed like he had kind of like an Ethan Long type of week where it just – uh, a week or two where he everything was just bombs. Uh, those are two guys that ASC is going to hope de and de definitely need to avoid that sophomore slump. Yeah, Jackson, uh, I believe, is the best defensive player on the team. I think he was the defensive player of the year last year. Makes some highlight real stuff. You know, as you mentioned, there's some room for improvement. Uh, 
you know, at the plate, though he brought some memorable times there. I remember the walk-off home run, I believe, on a Friday night was one of the highlights of the year uh, as far as that game winner last year. Uh, but he has the tools to be a next-level guy. I mean, just even when he arrived last year, you look at him physically, doesn't look like a college freshman. It looks like a guy, you know, ready to play in the big league. So, you know, you're, you're confident that he's just got a tremendous amount of God-given ability. And in year one to two, it's, it's obviously going to be, a you know, a big um, big season for him. New Contratus, as you mentioned, he's someone that there was that period of time where he was just absolutely on fire. I, I remember during that Arizona series last year, I mean, he just was hitting everything that was put in front of him. Some ups and downs over the course of the year as a whole, which, you know, and you can say the same for Jackson. They're freshmen. When you, when you have the, you know, the a full season of college baseball, you're playing, you know, 55 games, uh, you know, that, that can be a challenging thing. Just again, like in, in any sport, when you're making an adjustment to the next level. So those are guys that are going to need to be leaders for this team, you know, especially I imagine we'll talk about him with a guy like uh, Matt McClain being out for a period of time. They're really going to need to step up, especially at the plate. You know, let's talk about that. Obviously, an unfortunate injury you never want to see happen, especially coming into the year with a year that, again, probably early on at least, is going to be really relying on that offense. Nick McClain having the, the broken bone. Sounded like he's getting some light work done, and but still a ways off. And definitely is going to be leaving a hole in that lineup. Yeah, it's a similar thing to last year, you know, where he was hurt at the early standing of last season as well. When he came in, he just set the world on fire. So it's disheartening and, and disappointing that he's not going to be out there from day one because uh, he is one of the most talented players on this entire roster with what he can do. I mean, he's just got some amazing stuff there. So the team's going to miss him. And you certainly hope he can get back sooner rather than later. A couple of uh, new faces that have uh, joined this team in the offseason that are going to be counted on as key parts of this lineup you know, at second base, of course. Uh, last year, you had Luke Kiesel just you know playing a tremendous uh, uh, cog in the Sun Devil offense. He's gone, but uh, they uh, ASC went to the JUCO ranks, was able to get Kevin Karstetter. Uh, it looks like he's going to be taking that, that, that second baseman uh, role there. I know that some fa folks are really high on him. He put up some uh, put up some video game like numbers uh, at the JUCO level, and then Harris Williams. So it looks like he's going to be uh, slotted in at that leadoff spot guy with some good speed and kind of uh, kind of almost a little weird, Joe, that the ASU's got kind of the pipeline from from San Francisco in terms of uh, to Tempe in terms of that transfer portal. Yeah, last year you had Luke Keishel and Owen Stevenson. Now you've got Harris Williams. He was second team all conference in 2023. He hit 346, stole 22 bases. So you're talking about him being a leadoff guy can hit the ball and he can run. I mean, those are two things. He could do that at the leadoff spot. You might be able to make some money playing baseball. Um, you can talk about Karstetter hit 415, 12 home runs at the state uh, uh, the state college of Florida, which is a junior college. A couple other names on the, the transfer list. I was going through this uh, a couple of days ago, and some of them aren't necessarily ones that I, in the early reports that are being talked about is maybe being everyday guys, but uh, they, they have some impressive credentials. Uh, infielder Mario DeMera from San Francisco. He's a first-team all-conference pick last year, hit 348. Uh, Eamon Lance, at dead catcher, came from Santa Clara. They were a good team, as you might recall. They knocked Arizona, I believe, out of the NCAA tournament last year. He hit 356. He was all regional team and honorable mention on conference in 2022. Uh, and then others like Josiah Cromwick comes over from Oregon. He started 31 games there last year. Steven Ondina started shortstop for uh, Florida International. So you've got some guys that have got D1 starting experience and some that have got some pretty impressive credentials as far as like all conference uh, accolades and that sort of thing. Again, some of those are not necessarily being listed as everyday guys, at least going into the first weekend. But uh, Williams, I believe, was like a, was a preseason all conference uh, honors recipient for for ASU this year. So he's a guy that comes in as far as the newcomers probably having the highest expectations. All right, and then we turn our attention to the pitching staff, and obviously it's been a rough couple years uh, for Willie Bloomquist in terms of you know what he's seen from his from his pitchers. A lot of new faces, a lot of new arms in this on this staff, and so I think you know ultimately pitching is going to determine how far this team goes if they are going to be able to make a postseason run. It looks like Thomas Burns, a true freshman, is going to get the opening night start on Friday. Uh, Connor Markle, a GCU transfer, looks like he'll follow up in the rotation on Saturday with Tyler Meyer. Good, good to see him back from injury, missing all of last season, rounding out the, uh, the at least the opening weekend rotation. So there were some improvements year over year from 2022 to 2023. Just look at the numbers. Uh, ASU's team ERA in 22, 676. Uh, last year was 5.95. That uh, was ninth of 11 Pac-12 teams and 149th out of 295 teams nationally. So, you know, still, though it's 
slightly improved. There's a, a bit to be desired. But to put it into perspective, I looked up the numbers from last year. There are only six of 295 teams across the nation with a team ERA better than four. So we kind of have to take a different context when we're talking about college baseball compared to times, you know, with your MLB or other just thoughts you might have of baseball of, okay, like a good ERA is going to be, you know, a, a different range there. Uh, but ASU had some some instances where really the pitching just fell apart and it, it hurt them very badly last year. Uh, there were five games in 2023 where ASU scored eight runs or more and still lost. Mm. And in three of those five, ASU scored 10 or more runs and still <laughs> lost. And if you look back on the year, and I mean, realistically, ASU is probably – one win, maybe two, from being a tournament team. So when you have scenarios like that, where you're still scoring a lot of runs, but you're losing ball games, that's obviously something to fix. Um, and we talk about the roster turnover. There are only two pitchers on this 2024 roster who saw the field for ASU last year. And Jonah Giblin, Matt Teating, of course, Tyler Myers, you mentioned, has been on the team for a couple of years, but he was injured for all of last year. Uh, 2022, I believe he was the the primary midweek starter. If he's going to be kind of moved into a Sunday role, that's something that could be a good fit for him. So, yeah, you know, there there are some new bodies in there, and it's kind of like a different look. You know, last year we had guys like Ross Dunn, Owen Stevenson, Timmy Manning, you know, ones that had some experience at other schools. Uh, you throw a true freshman into the week, or excuse me, into the mix uh, uh, in Thomas Burns from the state of Wisconsin. You know, that's something that could be – better than the alternative because if, if you get some young guys in there who you know don't come to asu immediately draft eligible i get that the point is to get these guys to the pros but at least it just allows you to mitigate that massive roster turnover if you have guys again like burns who have a lot of years to play you mentioned that asu just narrowly missed a tournament berth a season ago and willie bloomquist says that you know he thinks that kind of their soft non-con schedule was one of the primary reasons to blame kind of that rpi coming back to bite them he made sure that wasn't going to be the case this year. They got a pretty brutal non-con uh, slate. Five teams that made the tournament a season ago are going to, ASU will be facing before they open up the rigors of Pac-12 play. Uh, and, of course, that includes a trip to uh, Globe Life uh, Field out in Dallas for uh, for a tournament. It's going to be facing some uh, quality opposition there. Joe, what's your thought, just you know, real quick, on, on terms of the what lays ahead for ASU in terms of the non-con uh, schedule? So as far as the non-conference, yeah, there there's some some challenge there, and it starts this weekend. I mean, Santa Clara, they're a tournament team last year, as I mentioned. I believe that they they beat and they might have eliminated Arizona in its regional last year. Uh, you know, so you've got you've got ten overall opponents. We can dive into more of the conference stuff, I'm sure, in in a moment. But you've got ten overall opponents who made the postseason. Two of which went to the College World Series last year, uh, and you know you you look at that non-conference schedule, and you've got you know, you've got opponents like Texas A&M and TCU. You mentioned that uh, tournament going on at Globe Life in, in the Arlington at the beginning part of March. Those are going to be some challenging teams. You know, just kind of like last year, ASU went to Mississippi State and had some success out there. I know that Willie Bloomquist likes to stress and, and challenge his guys. And as you mentioned, that's something that, you know, when, when you're a team that is just trying to work its way back into the postseason, these matchups really, really matter. Um, and – and so you have a, a few previews of Big 12. I believe Kansas State, Texas Tech, if I'm not mistaken, are on the, the schedule as well. So you've got quite a mixture. You've got a couple games with Grand Canyon, and you know those typically are pretty uh, pretty interesting to say the least. So uh, you know ASU's non-conference schedule. You know there are some challenging ones, and and some of them are not going to be at Phoenix Municipal Stadium. So ASU is going on the road to do some of that work. And then, of course, things really don't get any easier when uh, they open up a conference play. Pac-12 is always one of the best baseball conferences in the nation. Thoughts on what lays ahead, obviously, after they get through the, a, a pretty ga uh, daunting gauntlet of the, uh, the non-con and then in the final season of Pac-12 ball? So, you know, there are five Pac-12 opponents that, that ASU will face that made the postseason last year. Three of those are going to be series that are on the road with Stanford, Oregon State, and Arizona. And obviously, you'll have that kind of one-off game at home against Arizona that doesn't count toward the, the conference slate. And, you got, and then you you face Oregon early in the year. They ended up winning the conference last year. Uh, Washington also was a postseason team. So there are some challenges there. And a lot of folks are very, very high on Oregon State this year as like a top 10 caliber team. You know, could make some, some major national noise. You know, Stanford is still what it is. Uh, you know, Arizona isn't quite what it was 
you know, prior to their coaching change uh, a couple years ago. But they still, you know, to their credit, they uh, won a couple games in the tournament and that helped them get into the the, the NCAA tournament. The, the couple games in the Pac-12 tournament they won that helped them get into the NCAA tournament last year and maybe kind of stole ASU's spot in the eyes of a handful. So, you know, the it's going to be a challenging slate to say the least. So ASU is going to have to earn it, but you know that you certainly can't say that they're not placing rigor upon this team. And that's how you, you make guys better. And that's how you make programs better. That's how you get, you know, fans really excited when you have these challenging teams, again, whether it's at Phoenix Muni or elsewhere, you know, when you have these sort of things going on, gives you an opportunity to do something pretty special if you can rise to the occasion. The first two years under Willie Bloomquist have ended without a postseason appearance. And of course, last year, the RPI was one of the, the factors there. He made sure that wasn't going to be an issue here. But obviously, ASU baseball and the, especially the fan base has extremely high expectations for this program. You know, before we talk to, to, to Willie and get his thoughts on his team, Joe, do you think this is a situation where it's kind of a tournament or bust season for Sun Devil baseball? Um, I mean, it, it, you know, if we're talking about that in the context of, you know, if you don't make the tournament, you make a coaching change. I, I, I don't necessarily think that would be the case. I, I don't think. Um, I think this team certainly has the potential to get to the tournament, as we've talked about here m multiple times. The schedule will at least allow that if you can, you know, rack up some victories. You know, as, as we recall last year, for a good chunk of the season, you know, ASU was near the top of the standings in the Pac-12 before things really. Uh, slipped away from them in the late stages of the year. So, you know, this team's got the potential to do that. I believe that for the first time, obviously, in his two, you know, now entering his third season at ASU, that Willie Bloomquist has all his own guys there. You know, there are no no players that were that were recruited or signed by the previous regime. I'm not saying that's a knock on anybody. It's just that when you when a coach has all of his guys in there, uh, you know, that helps you get that buy-in. That helps get that unified team mentality toward things. So you know, I, I I would imagine you got to make the you got to make the postseason this year. You know, there's no one that's going to be happy with that. I know that they were you know very disappointed in how things uh, played out when it came to the NCAA tournament selections last year. Now again, as we've talked about, they could help their own cause in a lot of a lot of different circumstances, and sadly, it probably only would have taken one or two more wins to get there. But uh, for this season. I think you really need to get to the tournament because uh, if you don't, I don't know that that necessarily creates a you know a change after three years. Certainly, don't want for that to be the case. Uh, but it just makes things tilt into a direction that you want to stay far, far away from. So I know that there are some folks like the, some national reporters, like Baseball America, and some of these that kind of think of ASU as somewhat of a sleeper type of team. I'm not necessarily saying in you know the maybe the college world series realm quite yet, but as far as just one that could have a, a successful season at a rate that maybe some aren't expecting. So uh, if that could be the case and ACU gets in into the postseason, that at least would be an improvement for sure. A lot of new faces, a lot of questions, a lot of expectations. So it's going to be an interesting spring in Tempe and out, out at Phoenix Muni uh, for sure. But you know, Hey, that that's just uh, Joe and I talking a little bit to Sunday baseball. Let's talk to the man running the program, a Sun Devil alum, a guy who bleeds maroon and gold. Here's a conversation with head coach Willie Bloomquist. Uh, Willie, before we dive into kind of this season up ahead and everything that's going on with these 2024 Sun Devils, this is your third year uh, coaching your alma mater. Through those first two seasons, what were kind of some of the biggest lessons and takeaways that you had that you're applying towards 2024 and beyond? Um, I think, you know, for me, just just learning the landscape of college baseball, um, you know, was was a, a big challenge and, and everything, all the trials and tribulations, challenges that, that it brings you. Um, you know, uh, my first two years was a transfer portal and then the NIL. So, um, you know, when, when talking to some other coaches across the country and they're, you know, saying, uh, man, you, you chose probably the most difficult time to get into get into college sports with everything going on. But, uh, you know, with that and, and coming into it with not with uh, with no experience, really, so to speak, um, and having to learn all that and, and um, you know, figure out the college game, figure out roster management, that type of stuff and uh, recruiting. Um, it, it was certainly challenging, but, you know, once you you kind of try to start figuring that stuff out, it, it gives you a little more comfort, you know, after a couple of years knowing what to expect and um, and trying to, to solve the problems that we have and, and ultimately bring the program forward. 
So looking ahead to the non-conference slate, five tournament teams from last year are going to be appearing on that non-conference schedule for you guys. What do you want to see from your Sun Devils during that uh, pretty tough non-conference stretch? Well, I think that was, you know, by design, we wanted to, to make our, our, our schedule tough, um, you know, maybe a little too tough, I think, <laughs> at, at times. I'm like, boy, we bit off a lot more than we could chew, maybe. But um, at the end of the day, we don't want RPI to be a factor again. Um, so that was that was the reason for the tough schedule that we we put our guys or going to put our guys through. But, you know, at the end of the day, if we're we make it through that and, and are, are standing at the end of this thing, it's going to it's going to have us battle tested. And I think that's going to be great. But, you know, I look for our guys just to compete, compete every day that they're going out there, compete hard to uh, play the game the right way. Um, you know, from a pitching standpoint, hopefully, you know, throw a lot of strikes, work ahead in the count, good tempo offensive side of the ball just just stay aggressive um you know and, and hopefully create some chaos on the bases all that type of stuff and if, if we can do that I, I like our chances so early next month of course we'll be uh, heading out to arlington having the team play that mlb ballpark at, at globe life field a pretty stiff competition texas a and m tcu out there what are you guys looking forward to uh, from that team what do you want to get out of that that experience well i think um you know, you said it. I mean, we're, we're, we're playing against a couple of really good programs down there. That'll be a nice challenge for us on the road. Um, you know, we get a chance to play in Globe Life. We're uh, defending world champion Texas Rangers, you know, uh, call home. So we'll get a chance to play in a, in a major league stadium, hopefully with, uh, you know, a lot of fans and a, a big crowd, good environment. So Again, this is all preparation for for hopefully if we get into the into the postseason and, and can make a run. I mean, we're going to have to be able to play in those type of environments and not only play in them, but but be successful against really good teams. So um, this is a good challenge for us and, and a good opportunity. And at the end of the day, it'll be a great experience for our players. And of course, also looking a little bit, perhaps even further ahead in, into the next season. Of course, make the move to the Big 12. On this non-conference schedule, you have uh, some future foes there in Kansas State, TCU, Texas Tech, as well. Is that just kind of a coincidence, or maybe a little strategy of getting an early look at the future conference of foes? Well, I think a um, little bit of both. Uh, you know, we we looking ahead, and and you know, us being in the Big 12 or, or going to be in the Big 12 next year, it gives us an opportunity to, you know, to see TCU, which will be great, um, and. You know, with with a lot of our guys currently on our roster from the state of Texas, and then you know that's uh, that's certainly a, a hotbed for recruiting that we're going to try to continue to exploit and get some players out of out of that area. And so it's good for us to go down there and, and kind of put our footprint, uh, hopefully, in that state as well. Um, so you know, multiple meanings to, as to why we're going down there. But but I think when you look at the the overall experience that hopefully we'll take from it, that should be the paramount. And looking at some of the uh, the key players on this 2024 squad, obviously starting at Ryan Campos. You know, obviously, how critical is he not just at the dish, but also just you know being a, a veteran catcher, handling a young pitching staff and a, a staff with so many new faces. Well, I think he obviously can't be plays a huge factor in in multiple areas, but you know his bat speaks for itself. Hitting you know 380 over the last couple of years, uh, and just what he does at the plate but like you said behind the plate as a catcher i think that's important just his veteran presence that he's had um you know is going to be key for us and, and the fact that he can also play left field too uh which he'll find himself out there you know on occasion as well um gives us some flexibility to get some other guys behind the plate if we need to trey newman has done a a great job this fall and spring um josiah cromwick and, and even brody briggs you know could could find themselves back there on occasion and Campy gives us the flexibility of being able to move out to the outfield or DH, um, you know, keep him in the lineup. So, but uh, that and, and just ultimately his, his presence in the clubhouse has been huge. Uh, work ethic, he, the kids in there every morning, uh, 6 a.m. You know, it's it's tough to go to the ballpark and not find Campy there, um, just getting his work in and doing things. So, you know, that spills over into the younger guys on what true work ethic looks like, and and I think that's important as we continue to build. So, of course, pitching is going to be a, a, a very a key focus for this squad after a couple of years of trying to find the right mix on the mound. How are you feeling right now about the potential starting rotation? You know, I feel confident in, in our guys. Um, we have a lot of capable arms uh, you know, that, that are capable of eating up innings for us. And, you know, they're, I, I'm naive to think that there might not be some bumps and bruises, especially with the, the youth of our, of our staff. Um, but the, the good news is we have a lot of good arms that are capable. So if one guy is not on that day, we'll have to be able to shift gears and go to the next guy. Um, so the, you know, the key is, 
you know, hopefully um, managing it properly and, and getting guys out of there when they need to get um, get the next guy in, that type of thing. But uh, I like the way the rotation is, is stacking up right now with, uh, you know, we're probably going we're gonna to go with Thomas Burns, a true freshman on Friday, um, Connor Markle on Saturday, and, and then uh, you know, the big surprise is, is that we're happy to announce Tyler Meyer will be back in the rotation um, after a couple years of battling the, the shoulder injuries that he's had is uh, throwing the ball extremely well. So um, we're giving him the nod on Sunday um, and we feel good about our, our guys backing each of those guys up. And then as well, midweek guys as well, um, Adam Barron's and uh, will be a, a big, big key to that. And, um, you know, Ben Jacobs has been throwing the ball outstanding, another good left-hander that we've gotten. So uh, we got a lot of options, which is good. You know, speaking of Burns, you know, what is it about him that makes him the, the choice, you know, as, as a true freshman to be the opening day starter? Well, we might be, you know, pushing him a little bit, but I, I love the biggest thing for me that I can I can say why we feel confident is just the obviously the stuff is, is really good. Um, but the mindset and the mentality is great. He doesn't get phased by much. Um, you know, I don't think he feels the pressure of being a, a Friday night guy as a true freshman. He's just going to go out and compete. And, and that's what we like about him. He'll. He'll give up some runs every now and again, but you never see his body language get flustered or anything like that. He keeps his, his composure very well. And, um, you know, I think like I said, we might be rushing him a tad with him being a true freshman, but on the same token, man, how, how do you, how do you get experience without experience? So uh, time to, time to put your big boy pants on and, and get in there. And I think he'll be just fine. And you speaking of, you know, obviously you have been able to play true freshman, have great success a season ago, guys like Isaiah Jackson, Nuke Trotis, Kian Vu uh, as well. I mean, what improvements do you expect from that group, you know, of, of now sophomores heading into their second year? Well, I think, uh, you know, we expect them to take a, a step forward. Um, they had they had good freshman years, but, uh, you know, quite frankly, it wasn't good enough. You know, we, we, we got we were we were short last year. So those guys have to get better and continue to to lead this team and take the experience they had last year and, and take a step forward with it. So uh, I anticipate them being able to do that. Uh, New has done a, done a great job um, in the fall and in the spring, getting, getting himself prepared. Isaiah has done a great, continues to do a great job defensively in center field. And I look for him to take a step forward offensively as well. Um, you know, uh, we mentioned Campy, he, he's, he was a sophomore last year, junior this year, but um, you know, there's, there's guys that we anticipate you know, taking good strides uh, moving forward. You know, you announced not long ago that Nick McLean's going to miss some time uh, due to injury for any of our listeners who might have uh, missed that announcement. What does the timeline look at at this point right now? And how do you kind of feel, uh, you know, such a key player's absence in the uh, short term? Well, I think, um, you know, obviously that was disappointing that what happened with Nick, especially with how hard he's been working this, this fall and spring, but um, he, he's ahead of schedule. Uh, he got his cast off yesterday um, and, and is already starting to starting the rehab process with moving the hand around and, and getting that ready to go. Uh, he was taking fly balls yesterday, obviously not throwing, um, but but you know continuing to get his work in, which is great. So, you know, I'm I'm if I'm being very aggressive, I would like to see him hopefully back by Globe Life. Um, you know, the the Texas series down there. Um, I think that's being very. Uh, aggressive and optimistic. If he does, I'd be really happy. Um, but probably more realistically, the Oregon series following that um, would be something that we're targeting. Um, if he can come back sooner, it would be a, be a nice, pleasant surprise for us. Jacob Tobias is a guy who just kind of seems to quietly get the job done. Uh, uh, not a whole lot of fanfare, but just a guy who puts up numbers and a key part of that lineup. Uh, you know, what are you expecting him now, you know, as he's heading into his third year? Toby's, uh, you know, he's kind of the like you said, not, I won't say the forgotten one, but he, he's the one that just kind of does his job every day um, and is, is a rock in that lineup, RBI producer. Um, you know, he's probably going to hit cleanup most of the year, fourth or fifth um, for us. And, you know, I think that that's obviously an important, important spot in the lineup when, when you're hopefully driving in a lot of runs. And uh, we expect him to do that again this year. He, he's done it in the past couple of years. Um, and, and we don't expect anything less out of him this year. And, and he's another guy we expect to take a step forward. Um, and then, you know, defensively, he's done a great job uh, getting more mobile at first base and, and saving runs over there. And, and um, you know, I, I continue uh, to, to set the bar high for him on a defensive level as well. So 
I think, um, you know, Toby's just, like you said, the kind of that guy that just goes about his business, does his job every day and look up at the end of the year. And he's, he's been a heck of a run producer. So I expect the same out of him this year. Brandon Compton's uh, may not be a, a household name at this point, but it's very an intriguing name at this point. Looks like he'll get a shot. Uh, what do you think he could potentially bring to this table? Uh, you know, Brandon's a guy that, that's still still learning, um, you know, a lot of things and, and we'll, we'll need to make some adjustments. But he, he has, you know, light tower power, um, incredibly strong young man that that um, miss hits balls and, and plays pepper with the batter's eye, you know, when he miss hits them. So <laughs> he, he has that kind of strength that, that other people don't have. Um, fun to watch, um, you know, but there's going to be some growing pains, I think, with him a little bit on, you know, continuing to learn. Um, you know, learn how to hit at this level. And uh, do I think he can do it? Absolutely. Um, he, he's work ethic is no, um, no problem when it comes to him. He's in the cage all the time trying to refine his swing. And then, you know, don't forget about him on the mound either. I don't, I don't see him early on helping us out on the mound, but as he continues to progress and move forward, um, you know, that's a mid 90 mile an hour arm from the left side. So if we can get him uh, more fine-tuned in the zone. He, he, I expect him to have, to do big things for us in the future as well on the mound. Roster turnover is obviously such a, a, a big part of the sport across the nation. Uh, another year with a lot of new faces here. Uh, from you know head coach's perspective, you know what's your process in getting so many of these new guys kind of locked into your style of ball? Well, I think that's that's part of the challenges that we talked about earlier, right? In, in the college landscape that we're faced with is you know, hopefully getting these guys to buy in that, that, you know, this is a three or four year commitment here, um, you know, versus a one and done and, and flying the coop and going somewhere else and chasing a few dollars going somewhere. It's this program is special. And if you do it right, it's going to set you up for the rest of your life. Um, so getting guys to, to understand that and buy into, you know, in an, in an ever changing world where it's cool to go jump to the next, next shiny new toy, um, you know, being locked in and, and hopefully building the program that this is special. You're part of something bigger than yourself. And um, and guys realize that and, and hopefully guys want to stay here. And, um, you know, we hopefully moving forward don't have the size of roster turnover year in and year out that maybe other programs do. Um, you know, but but that's our focus is trying to to stabilize and get guys that, um, you know, that want to be here, that are that are locked into being here and. And occasionally, if we have to use the transfer portal to bring in a guy or two to, to fill a need, great, fine. But ultimately, we want to build with our incoming freshmen every year and, and stack those guys on top of each other. And I think that's hopefully how we're going to build a sustainable program. Between the freshmen, the JUCO guys, and the, and the D1 transfers, who are some of these newcomers that uh, really kind of caught your eye and may have some uh, Sun Devil fans buzzing here in the early part of the season? I think, um, you know, looking from the offensive standpoint, you know, Harris Williams, it'll be hitting lead off for us it is a nice piece that we picked up, um, you know, very capable bat does a lot of things on the base paths that'll, that'll make you, um, you know, it'll, it'll open some eyes just because he, he's an electric base runner and um, he's been getting on base a ton, you know, granted it's scrimmages, but I look for him to have a nice year for us, um, you know, Juco route, Kevin Karstetter. Uh, from the College of Florida is is a is a nice bat that'll be kind of in the middle of the lineup to start the year. Um, RBI producer, he'll pro probably play second base for us. Um, you know, which will be a um, key position certainly. Uh, Josiah Cromwick will get some playing time. You know, right-handed bat from Oregon. Uh, whether it's behind the plate or in the outfield here, in the absence of uh, Nick McLean, he'll he'll find himself in the lineup here and there. Um, you know, so those are the guys kind of from the offensive standpoint. You know, on the mound, you know, I mentioned Ben Jacobs, a kid from UCLA that, that transferred over his nice left-handed arm that is um, going to earn certainly a lot of innings on the mound. Um, you know, we just continue to to look for those guys to, to be an influence. And then, um, you know, the, 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 a lot of the rest of the pitching staff is, um, is freshmen with the exception of, you know, Connor Markle coming over from Grand Canyon. Um, will be good. And, and Hunter Omelette, another kid from Grand Canyon, that's uh, both of those guys are seniors. So um, that they should they should factor into the mix. Uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, kid from Arkansas, nice left-handed arm that that is you know, kind of funky. That he'll he'll go through the lineup once or twice, um, you know, depending on the on the team we're facing. So those all those are guys that will all contribute a significant amount. It seems that most of the discourse is around NIL these days is centered on 
football, men's basketball, and you know, in terms of the, the coverage and uh, attention. But you know, fr from a baseball perspective, what are you seeing? You know, obviously in a sport that is comparatively you know, fewer scholarships to hand out. What is the, the, the challenges and opportunities on the NIL front uh, for uh, major college baseball these days? It's, uh, you know, very similar. You know, it's on the, on the heels and the footsteps of football and basketball where, where there's, you know, there's some money being thrown around and, and guys, um, you know, it's becoming a key part of our, of our sport, whether we like it or not or whether we agree with it or not, it is what it is. So, you know, those are the challenges that we face. And, um, you know, we're going to have to generate some funds from from local local uh, business people and, and people that are willing to help out the program to, you know, not only recruit guys in, but but also retain our own guys as well. Um, it's just part of the landscape that that we're, you know, that we've been dealt and, um, you know, the, the college sports landscape, again, whether you agree with it or not, um, you know, it, it's 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 ever changing and we're going to have to adjust if we're going to survive and, and continue to be successful. Are you feeling any pressure now that uh, you know, you're trying to make a, a tournament appearance here in year three? Obviously, you guys came so very close this season ago. You mentioned, you know, kind of the adjustments in terms of the RPI front. But do you feel any uh, added pressure beyond just kind of, you know, the normal uh, expectations you have for yourself and the program to make a, a postseason appearance this year? Um, you know, that uh, any any sort of pressures you feel on that is external. Um, so the, the biggest thing we do as a program is focus on our guys um and and focus on playing winning baseball and the rest of it will take care of itself um you know obviously the expectations of this program are you know to be successful in the postseason and then hopefully get to omaha and, and bring us a national championship but you know in the in the parity that we were faced with in college sports and, and specifically baseball um you know that the challenges are tough uh you know the we have a lot of things going against us but on the same level, we like the challenge. And so for us, uh, you know, putting any external, you know, pressures on us for, you know, having to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, I mean, we live in a world where there's pressures no matter what you look at it or however you slice the pie, there's going to be some type of pressure. It just depends on what you want to put on yourself. And for us, we focus on playing baseball and going out and playing the best we can every day and put up as many wins as we can and, and let the chips fall where they may. As part of that process, you know, what are the, the top keys for this 2024 Sun Devil squad that must be achieved in order for those guys to have the season that you expect them in 2020, uh, the season? Um, you know, we try to keep it very simple, um, but be good at the at the simple stuff. Um, a pitching standpoint, working ahead, throwing a lot of strikes, not giving up your free 90 feet, uh, free bases, that type of thing. Um, you know, offensively, um, a lot of count, a lot of contact, you know, in the middle of the field and, and being aggressive from an offensive standpoint and, and, uh, defensively, obviously make the routine play, turn a double play. So if we are very good at those things, we're, we got a chance to win and play clean. If we play clean baseball. We're going to win. Um, if we don't, then, then we open ourselves up to, you know, to get taken. So, um, if we can handle the fundamental stuff and, and do that well, then it, it uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the winning takes care of itself if you handle the fundamental things. And last one for you. Obviously, you know, you focused on this season right uh, ahead of you, but this is going to be the last season of the of the Pac-12. And obviously, you know, you've had great success as a as a player and as, as a player of the year uh, in the conference. And what are your thoughts on just kind of the end of the the, the Pac-10, Pac-12, and then also the kind of the the future ahead moving to the Big Twelve. Um, you know, I, if I'm being perfectly honest, I'm, I'm partial to the, to the PAC 12. Um, you know, I thought it was, it's a wonderful conference. It's been a, it's been a mainstay and, and a dominating conference for, for over a hundred years. And, you know, there are more national champions in, in the PAC 12 than any other, any other flash in the pan, new conference or whatever you want to call it. it it's, it's the PAC 12 is, is the conference of champions. And we've had a, you know, a, a ton of success as a conference for, for a long time. And so to see that dissolve is, is kind of saddening uh, to be honest. And I'm a West coast guy that grew up on the West coast, but Hey, it is what it is. Um, you know, we have to move on and, and, you know, the landscape has changed and with that brings new opportunity. I think the big 12 has been absolutely outstanding for us. Um, you know, and welcoming us into that conference, uh, it's going to be a extremely competitive conference, um, you know, in, in a variety of sports, and, you know, their organization skills and everything that they've showed already just in, you know, the, the onboarding process has been very, very impressive. Um, so I think it's moving forward. It's going to be, 
um, it's going to be outstanding. If there is a conference that, that we had to dissolve the Pac-12 and move to, I think we're landing in the right spot. Um, the Big 12 has been, again, very welcoming and, and very forward thinking in what they have plans to do. So uh, from a baseball's perspective, I think it, it does. It certainly doesn't hurt us. If anything, it helps us uh, moving east, getting into Texas, Oklahoma, you know, Kansas, those those states where we're going to be on ESPN streamed. All of our games will be streamed on ESPN moving forward. Uh, so from a national standpoint, we'll, we'll get a lot more exposure that way. Um, there's just a, a number of things to be excited about moving forward, um, you know, even after you turn the page of disappointment of, of the Pac-12 dissolving. So uh, one door closes, another opens. We'll, we'll be excited to, to join the Big 12. All right, an exciting time here. Making his Speak of the Devils debut, stepping into some pretty big shoes because Jack Loader has been pretty great on the baseball beat the last couple of years, but continuing the lineage of great DevilsDigest.com reporter Scott Sanduli, a guy who will be soon off to France to cover the Olympics. And that gives you a little bit of insight into the quality that we're about to have on the show. Scott, welcome to Speak of the Devils. Appreciate the kind words, Brad. Uh, got a lot to live up to from Jack Loader, but uh, I like to think I can, I can at least carry on at least some of that in terms of the great Devils Digest baseball writers we've had. And uh, before we can think about France, first pitch in Muni Friday night, that's what I'm worried about right now. All right, so let's dive in. So obviously when you look at these last couple years under Willie Bloomquist, teams that uh, had some highs, some lows, especially on the mountains, we'll get to a little bit. But ultimately, what stands out about this 2024 squad when you kind of compare it to the first two iterations under Willie? Uh, I think the first thing you got to start with is that Bloomquist talked a lot about how this is his first recruiting class. Uh, when he first came in in 2022, inherited a lot of commits from uh, the Tracy Smith era and brought in, used the transfer portal a lot last year and to his success uh, in a 2023 season that went off the rails towards the end of the year. But uh, this is a lot of him and Sam Peraza, pitching coach and recruiting coordinator. This is their guys. And I think this is the first team that it's that's the case here. Uh, a lot of them are on the mound. There is a lot of freshman pitchers that are going to need to step up quickly. There's a lot of talent there. Uh, the lineup is a lot of holdovers from last year with some really good talent in there as well. So I'd say it's different in the fact that this is Bloomquist and Peraza's team, uh, a, a lot unlike how they kind of pieced together guys through the transfer portal last year and in, inherited a lot of Tracy Smith's roster in 2022. So obviously pitching has been at the forefront two years ago. Pretty bad. Just a shade under a seven in terms of the team ERA. A little bit better last year, and as you mentioned, a whole lot of arms, a lot of young arms as well. What level of confidence should Ace you have, our fans have right now in terms of will pitching be better in 2024, given so many new faces? Well, uh, it's hard to have a, ton, a much of a prediction or a confidence level. A lot of it's new. Uh, it's an entirely new weekend rotation. Uh, Ross Dunn, Christian Curtis, Timmy Manning, all drafted last year, all very good talents worthy of being drafted, uh, as well as their eighth and ninth inning guys, Blake Piveroff and Owen Stevenson. So it is a real rebuild of the key spots of a rotation that was talented last year, but uh, I don't want to say underperformed, but uh, towards the end of the season kind of tapered off and uh, as ASU struggled down the stretch and ended up missing the tournament. So it's a lot different this year in the fact that uh, your Friday starter is most likely going to be freshman pitcher Thomas Burns, uh, if any indication that I've gotten. Very talented kid, uh, throws 95 miles an hour, stands six foot five on the mound, a real intimidating presence. But one thing that you might not know about is he's from Wisconsin, and that's not exactly the most baseball rich uh, prep territory there. So that's a bit of a wait and see to see what he's got. Uh, Connor Markle looks like the Saturday starter, uh, transfer from GCU, a real steady left-handed arm. Isn't going to wow you with too much, but Sam Peraza kind of was very comfortable in describing him as the Saturday guy in that he can stable things out, settle down from the chaos that can come from a Friday night game. And, uh, Sunday, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but my estimate is that we're going to see Tyler Meyer, who is one of the only bright spots really of the 2022 pitching staff uh missed all of last season with a torn labrum era is a little inflated but he put in good work uh in 10 starts with the team as a freshman so i think now that he's healthy he could be a real kind of veteran presence despite being a sophomore and uh bullpen is a lot like uh a lot like the rotation the fact that it's unknown and it's a lot of freshmen uh but there's a lot of talent back there for sure wyatt halverson and 
Cole Carlone are two really, really talented guys that can really throw the ball pretty hard. Uh, Sean Fitzpatrick is a real plus transfer from Arkansas. Obviously, very baseball rich spot over there. Uh, great left handed arm, really devastating breaking stuff. I think he might have a good in at the closer role. But uh, Matt Teating and Jonah Giblin are both very steady guys that uh, filled in really as the first out of the bullpen spot sp starter guys in the midweek last year. Uh, yeah, it's going to be – it's a nice mix of some veterans, whether that's between ASC or different, and uh, freshmen. So it's hard to have a gauge because a lot of it is true freshmen and a lot of guys that people haven't seen before. So it's a wait and see. It's hard to have any sort of confidence level or prediction at this time, I'd say. And kind of on a related note, obviously Ryan Campos has been a very key part of the Sun Devil offense, just absolutely raking uh, during his time when he's been healthy. But also how extra valuable is he this year – Again, with so many young pitchers having that veteran presence behind the dish. Yeah, that's a that's very important. Having a, a experienced and a catcher that knows what he's doing back there for these freshman guys. And uh, when we talked to Willie Bloomquist last week, he told us that if you want to know how to be a professional, go follow Campos. And he is as professional of a college player as I've really ever seen. We all know what he can do with the bat, but uh, as a catcher. He is one of the more mature guys as I was talking about, and that plays a big role in getting these freshman pitchers settled down, kind of having amnesia of sorts that last pitch was the last pitch, now you move on to the next. And uh, a lot of the pitchers we talked to last week told us that he's been helpful in that kind of scenario, as have the other catchers, Josiah Cromick, Trey Newman. But uh, Campos really is as mature of a ball player as he is talented, and so he is going – He's going to play a big role in that factor. And uh, I think we'll see kind of him take, he's taken that leadership role already. So I think we're going to see that pay off as the season progresses for sure. And kind of a fellow third year guy, Jacob Tobias improved quite a bit from his freshman year to last year. What further improvements do, should we expect from Toby in 2024? Well, Toby's about as consistent as they come, uh, hitting well over 300, a really nice blend of power and contact, just a professional hitter up there from the left side, and really has made improvements in the field too as well. And uh, aside from Campos, that is probably your most reliable bat, as we've seen the last two years. He was a standout as a freshman, built upon it last year, and really humble kid, and he's never, he's always working to get better, and you can always see it in how the demeanor he carries himself and his swing path, how it, his real progression as a hitter, I think that is going to be just as – he is just as important to this lineup as Campos or anybody else because he's the most consistent guy they have. And we saw it in, in the uh, in the fall scrimmages and even the spring scrimmages thus far. His power is definitely up there, at least in my opinion, at least from uh, some previous seasons. But he hits the ball hard. He knows his own well. He's as critical to this lineup as anybody else in my opinion. Isaiah Jackson and New Contratus, they had some big time moments. Uh, you know, Contratus more perhaps with the bat and, and Jackson with the glove as true freshman a year ago. Uh, what are these two guys going to bring us kind of, you know, heading into their second year in this level program? Well, they're both really similar in the fact that last year they showed so many flashes as freshmen of what they can be. And uh, consistency kind of became a problem for them. Uh, it's, it's nothing new for freshmen, especially uh, coming from, the high school ranks straight to the pretty much the top of D1 baseball. And their biggest issue, I would say, was Isaiah Jackson talked about how carrying over like a bad performance from day to day, which you really can't do in baseball. But uh, both showed a ton of flashes, what they can do with the bat. Uh, one thing I would kind of harp on them is both had a little bit of the strikeout bug, which happens with freshmen. That's not that's nothing crazy. And they both, like I've said, both have four or five tools each. They are were mentioned in D1 Baseball's uh, 2025 MLB draft projections as first and second rounders. They have the talent for sure. Jackson showed us so many defensive highlights last year in center field. And with the flashes with the bat, he had a walk-off grand slam against Washington State with the flair for the dramatic there. And like I talked about, he's, his maturity showed a lot in that he's kind of changing the day-to-day -day and how just understanding how 0 for 4 can happen one day, 4 for 4 can happen the next. So – uh, I think in a lot of other lineups, he would be hitting pretty high up. Uh, he might get start a little low just because last year the batting average wasn't exactly where he wanted it to be. But definitely if he gets that consistency, he can be really, really huge in the next great ASU play, baseball player to come out of uh, Willie Bloomquist's program. And as for Contratus, he showed – he was up and down a lot last year too. His highs were very high. I believe he had a 16-17 game hitting streak at the start of conference play. 
And the kind of thing that kind of kept him back was strikeouts. He got a little swing happy during the year. Again, that's a freshman thing. Uh, third base is a really, really hard position to dr- to jump into play as a freshman, uh, especially he came from Hawaii. And that's obviously not the easiest thing to make such a jump. You're getting a lot of hard hit balls down there in the hot corner. And uh, he adjusted as the season went on, but errors were a problem. But I think that that's going to get cleaned up along with the strikeouts uh, after his freshman year. So in the end, both showed so many flashes last year. If they can just find that consistency, they're going to be massive for this team. As you mentioned, so many new phases on this team. So which newcomers are you most excited to see in action on uh, starting on Friday night? Mm, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Kevin Karstetter the most, I think. A JUCO transfer from State College of Florida. Uh, looks like he's going to take over the second base position where uh, last year he hit over 400 and drove in 77 runs, I believe, in a 60-game season. So <laughs> kid can hit. And although it was at the JUCO level, we'll see how it translates to D1. But uh, he really, this middle infield battle was as fierce as it could have been all throughout the fall and spring. And the fact that Karstetter kind of set himself apart with multiple weeks ago before the season tells me a lot about what the coaching staff thinks of him and probably the performances he's putting on in front of them. Great, great bat to ball skills, uh, runs pretty well. I think uh, he's going to be, I don't know if he has the power that Luke Kieschel necessarily displayed last year, but uh, he can fill in at second base in a way that missing a second round pick like that isn't going to hurt as much. Uh, aside from uh, from Karstetter, Harris Williams is going to be really intriguing. Uh, left-handed side hitter from can play either the corner outfield. Came from San Francisco where he hit almost 350 and led the WCC in stolen bases. I think I would be surprised if he's not the leadoff hitter on Friday night just for those reasons. Uh, I would say Brandon Compton is also an inter- intriguing piece to watch. Uh, missed, he redshirted last season. Real hard hitter from the left side. Two-way potential, but uh, it seems like they're going to use him just pretty strictly as a DH. And he can hit the ball really hard. I think those three guys are probably ones, the newcomers that could really make an impact from day one. But uh, there's definitely potential in Thomas Burns, like we talked about, a lot of the freshman relievers as well. And taking more of a macro view, you know, you talked about the offense and the uh, the staff. What do you feel are the is maybe the biggest area of strength so far right now? And right now, maybe the biggest area of concern uh, heading into the season? I'll start with the strength and the fact that uh, this offense is pretty darn good. Uh, They're going to hit top to bottom. There's a great, great blend of pure talent and just straight bat to ball skills. They bring back nearly every major offensive contributor last year from a team that was top five in the Pac-12, a serious baseball conference in almost every offensive category. Uh, So aside from Luke Kieschel and Luke Hill, who have since moved on, uh, a healthy season from Campos. He was hitting over 400 before he hurt his oblique last year. Hopefully a healthy season from Nick McLean once he comes back. Broke his handmate bone a couple of weeks ago. They expect him back uh, towards the start of March, and uh, they can get him back for that Texas series uh, when they go down to Texas for that preseason tournament. That would be huge. He showed a ton, a ton of promise as a hitter towards the end of last season. Uh, Another season under the belt for Contratus and Jackson, like we talked about, was really going to help them. Uh, Tobias, like I said, is steady as they come. So you got one to one to six or seven. These dudes are really going to hit. And I think it was Kevin Karstetter that told us a couple of weeks ago how there's six or seven dudes on this lineup that could probably be three hole hitters in some big time programs. And I believe that. And it is just and just the depth they have too. I mean, guys that may not play every day, such as like an Eamon Lance, who can hit the ball 500 feet. I'm convinced and there's a lot of really nice pieces in the middle infield with Ethan Mendoza and Jax Ryan. It is an unbelievably complete lineup. The depth is outrageous, in my opinion. So they're going to hit. Uh, and the concern, I would say, is going to come from the relief pitching the most. Um, starting pitching, I think, is a little less of a concern because Connor Markle, senior from GCU, he's got a lot of experience. Tyler Myers pitched a season already, although he missed, he missed last year. So Thomas Burns, is, is that an uncertainty? Sure, but... I think there's a greater uncertainty in the fact of the relievers. Uh, I talked about Sean Fitzpatrick from Arkansas is really the one veteran guy back there. Cole Carlone, Wyatt Halverson, Josh Butler are all freshman guys that are going to play big roles in this bullpen. So they're freshmen. How they handle coming from the high school level to the D1 level is going to be really interesting for sure. And uh, 
since it's hard to call it a concern, but more of an unknown is what I'd say. You mentioned ASU is going to be heading to Arlington. You're going to be playing some games at uh, Globe Life Field, home of uh, Joe's Texas Rangers. That's just part of a, a very daunting non-conference schedule. Five uh, tournament teams on that non-con slate. What's your thoughts on Willie Bloomquist challenging his guys like this before the rigors of Pac-12 play even get underway? Well, when we talked to Bloomquist, I think it was the first uh, media availability of the winter. He told mm-hmm. us, I will not get burned by RPI again, uh, <laughs> which is pretty much strength of schedule. And it is arguably what kept ASU out of the field of 64 last year, despite having a really strong season. Uh, they didn't have really that big non-conference opponent to really kind of tip the scales for them. And he was not going to let that happen. They start the season this weekend with Santa Clara, a team that played in their regional final last year, knocked out Arizona, which uh, Willie Boomquist was very happy about. Uh, A midweek with Kansas State. They're currently in the D1 baseball top 25. Ohio State's always tough in the Big Ten. Then you go down to Texas, Texas A&M and TCU. In the last two years, both of those programs have gone to Omaha, and they're both in the preseason top 10. So it is going to be a – trial by fire really with this ASU team. We're going to find out quick what these guys are made of and it's going to be big on those pitchers with a lot of them being freshmen. Uh, they are going to see the best of the best really early. And that's either going to be a really good thing or a really bad thing in my opinion. But how, however they manage to do that, the PAC 12, it's still the PAC 12 Oregon played in a, played in a super regional last year, lost a decent amount of that team, but still pretty good on that end. Cal's got talent. Oregon state's a top 10 team. Uh, UCLA looks like they're going to make the tournament. USC is back on the map on baseball. Stanford, they lost a lot of talent from last year, but it's Stanford. They've made Omaha the last, I believe, three years. And even even at the end of conference play, a two-gamer with Texas Tech, another ranked team, is from top to bottom, this is a very, very difficult schedule, and ASU is going to have their work cut out for them. A lot of new faces, a difficult schedule, You know, just the, the rigors of playing in a premier conference. So let's put you on the spot in your debut. Is this a tournament team? Uh, it's uh, it's hard to say right now, but uh, this is Bloomquist's third year. Uh, they are really confident in the guys they have. This lineup is ridiculous in terms of the talent it's got. I think there's a lot of upside in the pitching staff and that these guys are going to learn quick what it takes to be good at this level. Uh, I've always had faith in Bloomquist as a – player development kind of guy, this whole staff, really. I think that's going to show a lot this year, and uh, they're always going to hit. So as they bring those pitchers along, they'll have some of that comfort level. Uh, They might take some losses early on, but uh, I think they'll really start to roll in conference play. And uh, I think this will be a tournament team in 2024, definitely. Well, Scott, great stuff in your debut. Makes me want to say Jack Loader, who? I mean, this is going to be the first (laughs) of many. Uh, Tell our listeners how they can follow along with all the great stuff that you're doing. Oh, for sure. Uh, head over, head on over to devilsdigest.com. Uh, you'll see uh, post-game recaps, uh, new stuff, features from the baseball team all season long, as well as basketball and football if you're interested in that. And uh, hopefully some video stuff too for baseball once that gets going as well. Where can they follow you on social media? I uh, can't believe I didn't mention that. At Scott underscore, underscore Sanduli on Twitter, at Scott Sanduli on Instagram. That's where I'll post all my stuff. Well, Scott, again, great stuff. Really appreciate the time. And I have a hunch this might be the first of many. Speak of the Devil's appearances, Scott, thanks again. Honor to join. Thank you for having me, Brad. And that's going to do it for this episode of Speak of the Devils. I'd like to thank our great guests, Willie Bloomquist and Scott Sanduli of devilsdigest.com. Obviously, a lot going on with Sun Devil Spring Sports ramping up. Of course, never an off season in football. So make sure you stay with the show on the social media side. Follow on Twitter at SOTD Podcast on Instagram at Speak of the Devils. You can follow on Facebook and YouTube and give me a follow at BDenny29. And you can follow me at Joe Healy42. And a huge uh, shout out. Thank you to our sponsors and Jones Auto Group, DevilsDigest.com, Cactus Sports, Burrito Express, Spaghetti Shack, and Sun Devil Family Charities. And also be sure to uh, check out the good brand, HomeFieldApparel.com. All their great stuff, all their amazing ASU collection. Use offer code SOTD23 at checkout to get 15% off your first purchase. And once you're done supporting our amazing sponsors, make sure to drop us a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. And don't worry, Joe and I will be back soon to help get you through the Sunday, the continued offseason of Sun Devil Football. Hey, hey, hey.